We are ready. Central Florida Aerospace Academy, this is Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Roger that. We have a voice check. This is Cheryl Hardy with the FAA Production Studios. Station, this is the Central Florida Aerospace Academy. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Commander. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be talking with you guys today. We'd like to go ahead and start with the questions if you are ready. We're ready. Okay. I'd like to call Connor Isley. Please come on up. Hello, Commander Kelly. This is Connor Osley, future pilot. How are you, Connor? Pretty good. At what age did you become interested and involved in aerospace, and what was your primary inspiration? You know, when I was uh, when I was a little kid, I was certainly interested in being an astronaut. But kind of like a lot of kids are, it's. Uh, you know, a lofty dream, which I think is very important to have, and it was it was one of many things I was interested in, like many kids. Um, really wasn't until I got um, uh, to high school and, uh, you know, in college that I decided I wanted to uh, be a military pilot. And, uh, you know, my inspiration was, you know, gen generally came from uh, reading books about uh, aviation and uh, I was really interested in, in uh, flying airplanes off of aircraft carriers, so I'd say that was my uh, inspiration, flying uh, planes off of ships. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next person, uh, Dr. Coleman, this will be your question. I'd like to introduce Chad Ricketson. Hello, I'm Chad Rigginson. Um I'm in the 12th grade, and uh, I'm a second lieutenant in the Air Force JROTC program. This question is for Dr. Coleman. Um, doctor, what is the future of the ISS program now that the space shuttle is retiring? Well, I'm proud to be talking to a fellow Air Force person. Good luck with your career there. Uh, I think the future of the ISS is, is very bright. It is a vital step in our future exploration. Right now we're doing experiments actually every day on understanding what it's like for people and uh, the human body as we uh, spend time up in space here. There's changes that take place. Uh, we're looking at different materials for um, making spaceships out of, looking for different ways that fluids behave so that we understand how to fuel ships. Lots of different things that we can use the space station as a, as a laboratory to understand how to get further out into the universe. Thank you. Next, please, the next question will be for you. May I call Joe Anderson, please? Hello, Major Nespoli. My name is Joe Anderson, and my question for you is: um, How do you think commercialization will affect future will affect future space exploration, including countries involved with it? Joe, thank you for the question. There. Well, I think. Uh, there is no way out. We are going to go into commercialization in the future, and this will be, I think, good things for uh, for us, um, because uh, the more companies, the more industries are involved with it, the more things will will get better. We will be able to uh, exploit, use uh, space in a better way, and the cost will be uh, reduced. On top of that, uh, uh, people that are not 
professional will be able to go in space. I'm looking forward to the possibility that everybody can go in space, uh, think about a hotel, uh, being able to go in vacation uh, around the Earth and see this beautiful planet. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Commander Kelly, the next question is for you by Dustin Johnson. Dustin, please speak up just so they can hear, please. Hello, I'm Dustin Johnson, and I'm in the 10th grade. Uh, this question is for you, Commander. Do you find it difficult to eat in space, and how different is the food from here on Earth? Well, it's not, uh, not too difficult to eat, although sometimes if you're not careful, the food gets away from you a little bit, and uh, you might wind up finding it somewhere a couple of days later, which isn't too much fun. But uh, um, the way it differs the most is that it's not fresh food. And it's, uh, you know, mostly camping-style food that you uh, rehydrate or add water to or uh, food in pouches and cans. So, you know, the biggest, the biggest way it differs is, is it's not, uh, you know, fresh. And that's something that you, you, you really miss when you're up here. The next question, gentlemen, Ashley Sutter. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Ashley Sutter, and this is my question. What is your best piece of advice for someone who would like to be an aerospace engineer and have a career with NASA? Well, I, I recommend that you don't narrow your options too soon. I think to be a good aerospace engineer means, means that you need a good basic education in um, math, engineering, the sciences, all those things. and. And they all have a lot in common. And so as you go along, I would just collect as many tools as you can, as many skills, as many experiences. I'd talk to everybody you meet who is in the aerospace industry and ask them any question that you have and then use their knowledge to help you understand you know, what, what role that you'd like to play in that industry or at NASA. It's a place where we need people that like to learn new things and that uh, make sure that they're ready to learn new things. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Major Nestle. Daniel Roberts. Daniel, just be sure to speak up. Okay. Hi, my name is Daniel Roberts. Um, my question is for Major Nestle. Uh, what is the most spectacular thing you have ever seen while looking down on Earth? Hey, Daniel. It's actually very difficult uh, to answer to this question. I, I flew already once on the shuttle, and, and when I came back, I, I would say the most beautiful thing I've seen is uh, the sun going down, sunset or sunrises, because I'd see the, the sun going down in this little sliver of atmosphere with all these colors, absolutely beautiful. But then I came up here a month ago in this long duration mission, and I have the chance to look outside the cupola, which we did not have on the shuttle, and look down a little bit more, and, and, and I I'm getting used to recognize things, and you know it's very beautiful to to see uh, the cities at night. They lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, I mean, it's just astonishing. And then just this morning, I was looking down. We were flying over Africa, and I started seeing volcanoes and other things. So it's 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 very. I mean, I would say the Earth is astonishing, and every day I'm discovering something new, uh, and it's just a great view up here. The next question, again, is for you, Commander. Uh, Alejandro? Sure to speak up, Alejandro. Uh, good morning, Commander. Uh, my name is Alejandro Ibarmoda. I'm an aspiring aeronautical engineer and C-17 pilot for uh, the United States Air Force. My question for you is, what makes training for a long-duration mission different from a short-duration mission? That's a good question because they are uh, significantly different. The uh, the short duration mission on a on a space shuttle or in a future maybe a, another vehicle we might build, uh, you know, because you're not training uh, for a uh, 
you know a period of time on the International Space Station is uh, normally, or in the case of the shuttle, is centrally located for the most part in uh, Houston. Whereas if you're training for a space station mission, it uh, involves training in all different parts of the world, uh, Canada, Germany, Japan, and, uh, you know, and Russia, as well as uh, the United States. Um, also, you know, on a shorter mission, you can train for um, basically every minute of the mission. You can, you know, be prepared to do that task and, and practice it multiple times where that would be impossible for a long duration flight. So our, our training is somewhat more, more generic, whereas the, uh, the, the shorter mission is more specific. Thank you, Commander. The next question will be for Dr. Coleman. Eric? Good morning, Doctor. Uh, my name is Derek Mosier, and I would like to ask you, uh, what role will the ISS play in future exploration, including visiting other planets? There's a, a lot that we need to learn before we go and take uh, long journeys. You know, we know a little bit about life in low Earth orbit but for spending, you know, six months on the way to Mars, understanding the effects of radiation, um, the, the effects of the journey on a human person. We need to know a lot more about that before we start sending people. And so the ISS is a really good place to study that. One of the things that we look at quite a bit is um, actually osteoporosis or the, the weakening of your bones, dissolving of your bones up here. And we use exercise as a countermeasure to help that and also looking at some different drugs to help that as well. So these are the, some of the kinds of answers we need before we uh, venture further. And also a lot of things about spacecraft design, materials design. We have a lot of materials uh, hanging literally outside our space station, and our space station itself is a giant experiment seeing how it does in space so that we understand how to build uh, future vehicles. Thank you very much. The next question is for Major Nespoli, Savannah Edwards. Hello, my name is Savannah Edwards. I'm in ninth grade, and my question is, Given that the crew is international and comes from vast cultural backgrounds, what is the common language spoken and how do you cooperate to fulfill duties while on the ISS? Savannah, we, we usually speak English, or at least uh, I try and everybody tries here, uh, uh, but, uh, but we usually speak English. Uh, of course, uh, Part of the station is uh, control under the control center of uh, in Moscow, Russia, and part of the crew members are Russians. So when there are dedicated uh, talks about that part, they actually speak in Russia, in Russian. Also, uh, we fly up here with the Soyuz spacecraft, which is a Russian spacecraft. And when we are in that spacecraft, the primary language is actually Russian. So all the documentation is in Russian. The the, the to the, uh, we talk to mission control in Moscow in Russian, so we need to actually uh, learn Russian at a certain level before you can fly up here. Thank you. The next question is for Commander Kelly, Michelle Ray. Good morning. My name is Michelle Ray, and this is for you, Commander. How do you exercise to stay fit in space? Yeah, that's a good question. Exercise is really important up here because of the uh, microgravity environment. Uh, if we don't exercise, we'll lose uh, bone and muscle mass and have other, you know, effects like you do on Earth from not exercising, actually. But we don't get a whole lot of exercise just in our normal moving around. So exercise is very important. And uh, we have uh, on the U.S. segment three primary ways. We have a treadmill, and we're held down uh, with bungee cords to the treadmill so we can walk or run. And then we have uh, a weightlifting machine, and, you know, nothing really has weight in uh, microgravity. So it's really called a resistive exercise device, and it's... Uh, uh, mimics weights by uh, air pressure in cylinders, and it works very, very well. It actually feels like you're you're lifting real weight. And then we have a, a stationary bicycle, and uh, so we use the treadmill and the stationary bicycle for aerobic exercise, and the resistive exercise device for um, uh, weightlifting. And we do both of those. Uh, 
uh, types of exercise at least uh, once a day on most days. And on the Russian segment, uh, they have a treadmill and they also have a, uh, uh, a stationary bicycle kind of device that they can ride as a bike but also use for their arms. And uh, it's also uh, very effective to counter the effects of living in microgravity. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for uh, Dr. Coleman. Patrick McMillan. Hello, Dr. Coleman. I am Patrick McMillan. With the completion of the shuttle program nearing, how will the ISS be maintained and supplied? We have a series of supply ships. Uh, some of them have been coming for years, the, the Russian Progress supply ships, and, um, and those continue to come and resupply the station from all the countries that participate in the station program. And we also have um, a Japanese supply ship that arrives later on, this, uh, later on this month. And when it arrives, it actually hovers outside the station. And then Paolo and I, with the robotic arm, will reach out and capture that supply ship and then um, birth it to the station, whereas the Progress, the Russian vehicle, actually comes and, autom and, and dock, docks to the station. And then we have one more, which is the European supply ship, uh, the automated transfer vehicle, and that one comes uh, in February, and, and that actually docks to the uh, aft end of the space station. Plus, we have the space shuttle still, so a lot of different ways to get stuff up here. Thank you very much. The next question is for Major Nespoli. Philip Harrington. Hello, Major. Uh, this is Master Sergeant Harrington. Uh, with Robonaut 2 set to launch for, uh, to the ISS, do you feel this advantage in technology will ever take a person's place in space? And will it enhance our chances to send humans further out into the universe? Well, I wish they would be able to build a robot that would be able to be like a human, so I'll send him to work and I'll go on vacation. <laughs> so that would be nice, I think, for everybody. Uh, you'll probably send somebody a robot in school and you go also somewhere else. Anyhow, um, I, think, I think in the future we will get there where robots will get uh, more and more capable of doing complex uh, things. And for sure, we would really like to have robots up here that will do uh, simple, tedious things that we, we need to do every day. And, and, and we do, but sometimes we make mistakes because we don't pay attention or, or, or they're just too repetitive and too boring. So it will happen. I think it will happen and it will really help us as it will help us on our daily life if we will be able to have uh, help and support in our daily tasks and chores. Of course, it would be bad if we would build a robot and set the robot in vacation and we could, would stay at work, but we will work on that. Thank you, Major. Unfortunately, due to time, this will be the last question. Commander, this one is for you, uh, from, Ms. from Andrew Nelson. Uh, hello, um, my name is Andrew. Uh, what is the largest scale experiment your team is performing while on the ISS? That's a good question. You know, we have uh, over 130 different science experiments uh, being conducted on board the space station during the time I'm here. But I think the biggest experiment is just the space station itself. Having a uh, facility that's operating in low Earth orbit for 10 years now and uh, another 10 years to come, manned by uh, humans uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year is a experiment. You know, this space station um, has life support systems that need to be uh, operated for a really long time, electrical power systems, cooling systems, and uh, not to mention the human system, which all of those combined is very, very important if we are ever going to venture away from this planet. So uh, I think, and it's often overlooked, that you know the biggest experiment is just this whole facility and the, uh, you know, the space station program itself. Thank you, Commander. Commander Kelly, Dr. Coleman, and Major Nespoli, on behalf of the Central Florida Aerospace Academy, as well as all of the Polk County Schools, we want to say thank you to you. Thank you for their, your time. Is there any last words that you would like to say to the students uh, of Polk County? 
Yeah, well, I'd like to encourage you guys to, uh, you know, work hard on your education because that's really what is going to pay dividends uh, for your future. And you never want to you never want to limit yourself. And uh, the better you do in school, the more options you're going to have as uh, as you get along later in life. And those options are going to be very important to you someday. So, you know, keep up the hard work. And uh, it's great talking to you guys today. Commander Kelly, uh, thank you very much to you and your crew, and also uh, we would just want to say thank you for making our dream a reality. We sure appreciate you. You're welcome. Have a great day. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, Central Florida Aerospace Academy. Station, we are now resuming operational communication. Copy, thank you. <laughs>